From financial security into retirement to cybersecurity at the Capitol, these issues are featured in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The security of the Capitol Area Complex continues to be scrutinized. The Advisory Committee on Capital Area Security continues to delve into a variety of security issues. This particular meeting focused on keeping private information safe. You mentioned comparing with different states, but I don't have a sense of how we compare with other states. In a way, when you read the NASIO report, um, it, it's kind of like it paints a view of state government in the security space as an entire continent of third world countries. So you can say you're at the top of the pack in a, in a certain space, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're really at the point you need to be from a security perspective. Chair of the Advisory Committee on Capital Security, Lieutenant Governor Yvonne pretner Solon joins me now to talk a little bit about the committee work. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Julie. Well, let's begin, Lieutenant Governor, with the fact this committee has been meeting for well over a year now and in January of 2013 issued a report highlighting key areas of concern for safety. Can you encapsulate the general assessment of that report? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, it, actually we were established by law in 2011 and so we started meeting the beginning of, of uh, 2012 and we're charged for 10 years with, coming, with doing a, an assessment of security in the capital area complex. And that encompasses a number of issues, whether it's just the physical security or a cyber security or it's the continuity of government if something should um, occur of a catastrophic nature where the capital would not be a safe place to be or it was destroyed. So it, it actually covers a, a large area. And uh, our charge is to meet annually and to make an assessment of security and then make recommendations to the governor and to the legislature on an annual basis by January 15th. And you have gone on record stating that you believe the Capitol has vulnerabilities. How vulnerable do you think it is? And does the report reflect that level of vulnerability in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think everybody has vulnerabilities and I don't know that um, we have done a thorough enough assessment actually of how vulnerable or how, how safe we are. Um, everything is anecdotal at this time. And so um, last year we recognized that we had a very slim staff compared to other capital areas around the country and made a recommendation to increase the number of troopers that were on duty on a regular basis as well as the number of security staff that are contracted with um, at the Capitol complex. We also um, felt that it should be centralized because traditionally here at, at the Minnesota Capitol, each agency has um, taken care of their own uh, cap, uh, their own security for their agency and we felt that we could be more efficient and that and more cost effective if it were a centralized organization right here with capital security. And you mentioned earlier cybersecurity. Has this always been on the radar of this committee or is it something that just recently appeared given some of the issues ha happening on a federal level and also the security breach, although it was a human error, the security breach with Minshore certainly brought it back into the headlines again as well. No, it's always been on the, at least at least for the last two years, but I know that it was even while I was in the legislature. Um, was something that we knew we needed to be aware of. Um, there's a lot of data, private data, of our citizens that is kept in a number of our agencies, whether it's in health or revenue or, 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 or uh, Department of Transportation. And we believe we have a responsibility to protect that data. And so we need to be aware of uh, where the vulnerabilities are. Today, actually, our meeting will be on cybersecurity. Let's talk about another issue that continues to, to pop up, and that is, of course, whether or not guns should be banned here at the Capitol. There are varied opinions on the matter, even in, your, in the committee. The current system essentially trusts individuals who will be carrying here at the Capitol to alert Capitol security that they will have a, a weapon. Do you think that the system is, is good enough? 
I think that there are holes in the system, and I think there are ways that we could tighten up our security. Um, keeping in mind that this is the people's house and that we do want people to have access and free flow into the Capitol. We also want to assure that the people that are in the Capitol are safe while they're there. We need to protect our visitors. We have a number of children that come through here. We want to make sure that they're safe. And we have a number of staff that work in the Capitol, but not just the Capitol. It's the whole Capitol complex, which is a large area and encompasses most, if not all, of our agencies. So, Lieutenant Governor, the report that was issued in January does acknowledge that politics and varied interests can kind of can get in the way of implementing some of the recommendations. If there are, say, a handful that you feel are must-haves, things that you want to make the, the entire complex more secure, what would those be? I, d I don't actually have that. I, I know areas that I think we need to discuss, and I think the first business is educating people, and then, based on that education, doing an assessment to determine whether or not there are vulnerabilities that exist. Um, I, what I'm aware of is that all people have to do is to call up and say, I have a license to carry and I will be carrying in the Capitol. Well, um, we don't always check to see if they actually have a license to carry. And we never ask people on what days they will be carrying in the Capitol. So we don't have a count at any time about how many guns might be in the Capitol. Um, the question also is whether chairs or, um, or caucus, uh, the majority leader, the Speaker of the House, has any authority to say, you know, we're taking up some pretty volatile issues today. Mm, we'd like to keep guns out of the chamber or out of the committee room on this day. I don't know if that's something that should be allowed or not, but it certainly deserves discussion because people have expressed that they don't always feel safe. And even though some people have a, a, a permit to carry, uh, there, are, there may be people carrying in the Capitol that have no permit to carry. One other thing is that once they say that they have a permit to carry, According to the policy that we enforce at this point, they're able to carry those guns, I mean, into perpetuity. Uh, and it isn't tied at all to when they have to become relicensed, which is every five years. Lieutenant Governor, as the chair of this committee, you're essentially charged with figuring out how to formulate these recommendations as well. Is it your preference that? Perhaps a big sweeping piece of legislation is introduced next session, or would you rather handle these issues individually, you know, um, you know, navigate issue by issue instead of one big, broad piece of legislation? Um, I haven't give it a tr given that a tremendous amount of thought, although generally I think about d um, providing a report, and in that report the uh, the bill that we would recommend to be introduced. And I think it's probably easier for people to understand if they see something globally and how all the pieces fit together rather than having separate pieces of legislation uh, going through the system. Okay, with those words, thank you so much for joining us here on the Capitol Report set. We really appreciate having you. Okay, thank you, Julie. A couple of months ago, the advisory committee focused on whether or not guns should be banned at the Capitol. We sat down with Representative Michael Paymark to get his thoughts on the issue. Well, first of all, my personal opinion, and I've made this clear, is I don't think guns should be brought into the Capitol. I, uh, um, I think we're one of, it's hard to get the exact number, but one of uh, eight or ten um, states uh, nationally that actually allow firearms into the Capitol. So I don't think this is, we should be bringing firearms into the Capitol. But having said that, if that is going to be the policy, then I think what we need to do is to make sure that whatever policies we have are enhancing public safety. And the current policy says that 
All you have to do is notify the, uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety and say that uh, I, I intend to bring a firearm into the Capitol. And you can bring that firearm into the Capitol in perpetuity. There's no one checking to make sure that you have a concealed carry permit, that you've gotten any training. And to me, that's a, a huge uh, gaping hole in the process that needs to be fixed. During the hearing, you brought up the point of expectations, essentially expectations of those who do carry firearms. What is your expectation of those who do have a permit to carry? Well, again, I don't think they should be allowed right. to bring but firearms given that into they the Capitol. Well, I think that that's, that's the myth out there, and that's what I was trying to expose today at the hearing, is that uh, Representative Woodard, who's a member of the committee, last at our last meeting said that, the, that we actually have a, less of a threat due to the fact that these folks are carrying firearms into the Capitol. And, uh, and the head of this gun owners civil rights group, uh, he made that comment to the press that we're actually safer because they're armed. And so my questioning was, was uh, what if somebody were to, um, a law-abiding citizen became uh, non-law abiding and decided that they wanted to uh, to harm somebody is there an expectation that the people who have a concealed carry permit can act as a police officer get up and take de deadly force against that person and I think that the the answer to that question was no they do not have the right to do that they have the right to protect themselves and they have the right to protect protect themselves in their own household but they the, at least from the testimony today do not have the right to uh, shoot somebody who might be uh, uh, causing imminent uh, bodily harm to another person so that's that was the point of of the conversation is as they say you know, we're all safer because of them carrying when, as a matter of fact, they really should not be using a firearm. And if they did, I would hazard to guess there would be pandemonium in a, in a hearing room like that if somebody did uh, bring out a firearm. And I, and I, and I want to say this, too. If you look at the Senate chambers and the House chambers, um, you know, we, there is a, there's a huge vulnerability there where anybody can sit in those galleries. Uh, whether they're carrying or not, whether they have a permit or not. And I think there's a lot of safety issues in this capital that we should be addressing. So one person did suggest that perhaps guns be banned in the House and Senate chambers and hearing rooms. Is that a possible um, compromise, in your opinion? Well, I certainly think that would be a, a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, the fact that uh, certain legislators carry firearms on the House and Senate floor doesn't make me feel any safer. Again, if you look at the uh, the galleries of those uh, two chambers, uh, uh, I think that there's some risk factors there that should be considered. So, and as a chairman of a, of a committee, uh, I would like the ability to say that my committee rooms, uh, you know, guns aren't allowed. Check them at the door. If we're going to be the Wild West, we might as well use that language. Representative Paymeyer, I do want to ask you, Major Bob Meyerson with the Minnesota State Patrol did testify that there hasn't been any kind of a problem or violation of this law to his knowledge. So given that, do you think these hearings are looking for solutions to something that isn't necessarily a problem right now? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's fairly obvious from his testimony that they don't check people. I mean, uh, uh, they check people only who they can actually see are, ca are carrying a firearm like in a holster. They'll check to see if that person has a valid permit, but if it's a concealed uh, gun, uh, they have no reason and it's not their policy to ask somebody whether they're carrying or not, so they don't know. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two is, is that I, I think that that's a mistake, especially a, a, a committee that's constructed to look at, at uh, public safety. I think it's a mistake to say, well, we haven't had an incident now, so let's just let, ev let, let's just let everything go the way it is. Um, I think the governor's mistaken to take that view also. Um, I would, you know, there was a case just out in Pennsylvania where someone came in and shot out, shot out a, um, a, a government building and killed somebody. I mean, it's not like these things don't happen. It's not like we haven't had massacres with firearms across the country. Uh, so to say because we haven't had a shooting, uh, at the Capitol that, uh, that we shouldn't be looking at tightening on policies to me is, is short-sighted. 
and uh, you know, I'd, 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 hate, I'd hate to be the legislator or a committee member who said, well, you know, there's no problem. Uh, and have something happen here and then have to answer to the public when we had a, a fair amount of public uh, and professional recommendations that, that there are security problems in this capital. Okay, Representative Michael Pamar, unfortunately we are out of time. We will track this committee though as they make it their recommendations and perhaps get you on at that time as well. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Providing options for patients about to be released from the state security hospitals prompted this meeting of the Senate Health, Human Services, and Housing Committee. Members continue to discuss ways to move the state-operated service in a positive direction. There are more and more private services being developed for people, uh, for people living with developmental disabilities, and we are confident that we can move clients who are currently residing in our facilities into other community-based settings. A number of community-based providers have, have stepped up, have increased their capacity, and, and now are very um, <clears throat> willing to step in, provide services to people with developmental disabilities, which allows us to repurpose our facilities for people with who are have been committed to the commissioner as mentally ill and dangerous. Um, and, and for other populations. So um, we will, in the 2014 session, be able to demonstrate to you that the number of people with developmental, de developmental disabilities being served by the department will have been reduced, um, and those facilities repurposed for serving another population that will help with client flow. Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen sits on the advisory committee and he does believe guns should be allowed here in the Capitol. We talked to him about that issue and whether or not he believes the Capitol is vulnerable. The Capitol essentially has been classified as vulnerable when it comes to security. Do you think there is a public safety issue even though nothing has happened? Do you think there is a public safety concern? You know you could say that about any building where there's people coming and going, Julie. You could, you know, uh, obviously the Vikings has a large group of people there and those kinds of events. and and they're actually checking bags and I get that and I understand it and people expect that you should expect to be safe but frankly uh, in Minnesota I think the track record of the permit carry holder uh, people that, that go through the time and effort and uh, uh, to carry out their Second Amendment rights to protect themselves is, uh, is, is has been a tremendous track record and frankly I don't think people have anything to worry about uh, there's nothing out there to, to show that they have to be worried and in fact, I would be more worried about a gun-free zone. I mean, gun-free zones so far have been, have been tragic. There's been some very horrible tragedies that have gone on. You did say in the hearing that um, you did acknowledge that courtrooms shouldn't have guns because of the emotion involved. You also acknowledged that the Capitol can be highly emotional at times as well. So why not have a parallel standard, as some suggest? You know, I think I think security is right now, Julie, really beefed up when there is when there is a, a real high secure area. They're not they're not doing the uh, metal detectors or anything like that. Courtroom security is different, it really is. Now, now lives are actually changed, not potentially changed, they are being changed by a judge or a jury. That's not a real fair comparison. Uh, we're dealing with and you know, having open conversations about laws that need to be fixed or tweaked or, or whatever. It is not the same, it just isn't. And uh, uh, I come back from the uh, history of securing the courts in my previous life and I also lost a partner that, that uh, that was killed uh, by somebody who actually stood in front of the judge and had four guns on them. That initially got the security thing going for courts and uh, they should be secured. Uh, I, I, if I was a sitting judge or jury I, would, I wouldn't want to be the, I, I just wouldn't want to be able to, I wouldn't want to be in court without that security. But it isn't the same in the legislature, it is the people's house. Okay, well Senator Representative Michael Paymar, <coughs> excuse me, did ask Public Safety Commissioner Mona Doman her opinion on the current policy of those who do want to bring firearms to the Capitol and essentially current law requires that there be notification to the Commissioner of Public Safety. She did say that there's no verification mechanism in place via legislative authority. So do you think the legislature could go further and perhaps expand how they make sure that somebody really does have a permit to carry? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, if I know the process because I've done it myself. I've notified the Department of Public Safety. I give them not only my permit number from the sheriff of the uh, issuing authority which is Douglas County where I live but I also give my driver's license number and I'm assuming what they're doing is they're doing a background check to make sure that I have not been convicted of or or being basically being charged with a felony 
Uh, I hope that that's going on. If that's the case, it, it, you know, unless you're convicted, of course, but it makes, the, it makes the permit null and void. And at that point in time, it would trigger a mechanism in security where, where the uh, local sheriff would be contacted. That permit probably would have been called in. And security works that way. I mean, that's how it works. But what you're finding out is that the people that, that are law-abiding, once again, are doing it right. Uh, the person that's going to come in and do some harm, uh, I'm not going to say it never would happen, but they're certainly not going to tell you that it's going to happen. And if, I'm a, if I, uh, if I want to be able to protect myself, I should have that right. And again, the track record is there. Uh, so let's go down that road just a little sure. bit. Do you think this conversation at this point has been a little too narrow, that the concern is too narrow when it focuses just on guns and not necessarily on bombs and other, other things that could cause significant harm to public safety? I think that's certainly a legitimate uh, concern. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, politics and, and politicians certainly do not have a very good rating amongst the uh, general public, and uh, I understand where, where, uh, where there should be some more concerns. And again, if you come and testify, you should be in a safe environment. Uh, but if it's if it's going to be a it's going to be a high uh, uh, you know an area where where you're going to have some 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 potential issues, then I think security should be able to check that bag, quite frankly, and and, and ask, are you carrying a handgun? If you do, here, where's your permit? Okay, my last question for you, Senator, is Representative Paymar has stated he'd like to ban guns at the Capitol. He also acknowledges that this likely won't happen. So, what do you think good compromise language could be? I don't know that there is a compromise uh, with, when it comes to the Second Amendment. I think you're, you, you've seen that last year in the legislature. Uh, uh, Representative Paymar was actually uh, brought forth this legislation, and quite frankly, uh, uh, the sleeping dog came alive, and uh, there was really no reason for it. And again, if it's knee-jerk because of Aurora, Colorado, or Sandy Hook School, uh, quite frankly, there, there's no comparison there. We could have never stopped those things. The only thing that could have stopped those things, as I said in my committee today, is maybe in somebody in the front row could have stopped that threat by having a personal protection handgun on them and actually stop the risk just like a law enforcement officer would. Okay, Senator Bill Ingebretson, as always, we love having you on the set. Please join us again soon during session when I'm sure this comes up again. Thank you again for having me. Ninety percent of working age households in the United States are not saving enough for retirement and about 45 percent of those don't have anything saved at all. Joining me to talk a little bit about this trend and what can be done about it, we have the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce, Mike Rothman. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate Wonderful your time. Wonderful to be here. Thanks. Commissioner, let's begin with the program. You're hosting a series of podcasts to educate consumers to essentially make smart money decisions and avoid scams that will lead to a more secure life today and for the future. Taking that right from your website. So what does this all entail? Well, it's important, I think, uh, to, for folks to have uh, stronger financial literacy and more information for two reasons, mostly. One is so that they can make smart financial decisions from kindergarten through retirement, starting young, uh, go out and help kids understand what is money, wh uh, what can they do with the difference between needs and wants. Um, for people who are earning, earning money and uh, family, family budgeting. Uh, kids coming out of college today have high student debt and how they have to be careful about what they're doing. And then for people who are in retirement. The second part of it is that um, coming as Commerce Commissioner and coming from my perspective, people need to make smart decisions. Um, you can get duped too far into a scam or a fraud. And uh, my staff uh, work and we investigate all that stuff that's happening. Um, and then I think in between, people just need to make uh, smart, wise decisions and choices. And uh, so that's a part of what we're doing. And for the sake of this segment, we're going to keep it with that middle group that you just referenced. And your office does have a website offering 30 tips to become financially, financially literate and make some changes that would help allow them save for retirement. What do you think a couple of those key steps are? Well, most importantly, I think people have to look at their family budget. We just went through uh, tough five years of of the economy. With your job and with your family budget, see if you can set aside uh, some money for retirement. Uh, put it aside. Uh, talk to somebody about it and make sure that I think you're, you know, you're looking ahead. The numbers you were talking about earlier, uh, there, the, the average amount of savings is about $30,000, $40,000, and it's just not enough. So I would say look at that and try to put some money away. 
And so, Commissioner, working off of that, a recent Gallup poll finds that 20% of all Americans didn't even have enough money to buy food that they or their families needed at some point over this past year. And median incomes have fallen for the last five years in a row. So how do you take this idea and make it practical for people who are truly living paycheck to paycheck? You know, it's a, it's a hard thing. And for folks who uh, are in a tough situation, what I say is, um, and, and I grew up that way. Um, my mom was a single mother. She raised us uh, three kids, stretched every dollar, looked at the checkbook and tried to balance it, uh, made sure that the payments were stretched out over time. But what, you, what, what people need to do, I think, when they're in the, that situation is to make sure um, that their credit doesn't drop, that they don't add too much credit to their, you know, too many credit cards and to keep an eye on your, your what they call the FICO score uh, because that can get too low and then you're gonna be stuck. So finding ways to improve your credit if you need it, finding ways to work with folks to get to the right credit and to save um, are all the things that we talk about doing. And here's your chance to speak to the consumer with number 13 on that list was pay down your debt. With the holidays quickly approaching, any advice for folks who might tend to spend, you know, go a little overboard for the holidays or just figure, well, why not? We're already in debt. It's a hard thing because I do the same thing. Um, you know, it's hard. We have three kids. I'd say um, spend within your means. Uh, find out what that is and do what you can uh, to make the holidays joyful and cheerful for your family. Okay. Getting back to this financial literacy and the retirement component. Why do you think it's so important for Minnesotans to save for retirement? Why, why should that be a goal? Well, think about it this way, and I don't think many people look that far in the future, but um, I was just at a senior assisted living home talking with seniors just now about uh, their situation in life. So it can make the difference between financial security in retirement or financial hardship. Uh, so people should plan ahead and to try to save as much as they can uh, to do that. And then I think most importantly, when you talk to, when I talk to my grandmother or uh, senior citizens, um, they're, they've gone through tough financial times. The amount of money they could earn on interest has dropped just like everybody else. And so they get duped into or people convince them to go after high yield schemes like promissory notes which we find happening all the time and so we just want to make sure people save enough if they can and to be smart about not getting into scams uh, that will actually ruin their their future okay commissioner rothman we will of course provide the website information a little bit later in the show but thank you for your time thank you That concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thanks for watching.